Thank you. Start over. <laughs> okay. I think we're all set. I'll try not to bump anything up here. Uh, this, uh, I'm John Green, KX4P from uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And I used to be, uh, for many years, a resident here in Charlottesville, and I was active in the Albemarle Amateur Radio Club. So some of you guys are old friends that I'm getting to be new acquaintance with. And uh, I, I remember Pete, I remember uh, Jim, I remember yeah, well, probably half of y'all, and uh, maybe, yeah, Joe, I certainly remember Joe. I, I, I've given a couple of programs at the club before, I think maybe three of them. And, uh, and one of them, I restored an old radio that was, uh, I was real proud of and uh, very delicate radio, but I did open up the lid of it and uh, Joe poked around in it and he could identify every tube inside of it without seeing it. <laughs> and I was uh, really impressed with that. I thought the next radio I got to work on, I would just send it up to Pete and uh, see how far he would get and maybe do the whole thing for me. But um, I'm very much indebted to uh, Jim Wilson, K4 BAB, sitting down here on the front row, uh, for inviting me. We've been friends many, many years, but for inviting me to go to a conference at the Green Bank uh, Radio Telescope facility. Uh, and I, I practiced this, I've tried to get the whole story correct. But some of you may be people that work for, maybe design engineers or scientists or secretary to somebody for the National Radio Astronomy Organization. So especially you folks, if you would, uh, don't embarrass me in the meeting maybe, but uh, afterwards I'm looking for critique to try to get this right, okay? And I do have some questions about even what I present. So I do want to try to uh, give you the whole program. Uh, one person left last time I did this before the meeting was over. And uh, most people stayed awake and alert and uh, didn't get into groups talking and chatting, you know, all that it's going on. One person did have to leave and I was thought, well, I wonder what I said. But the next day he sent me a real nice email apologizing for leaving and to pick up his wife up someplace and asked me if I could send the slides to him so he could see the rest of the show. So I hope it will be interesting for you. So no more beating around the bush. I've got a lot of apologies to make and people recognize, but, but let's see the program and enjoy it. This is a trip that I made with Jim. He invited me to uh, go on this trip. And I've been a ham operator since 1956. You can figure out how, how long that is. I've been a ham operator since before I was born, I think. So uh, you can calculate my age and uh, with that a whole lot of trouble. But uh, I thought I knew what radio astronomy was all about. I looked at the astronomy magazines, things like that. But this trip was an eye opener to me. Uh, not only the technology of it, but the history behind it. And uh, to think that this is something that has come into the field of science within my lifetime. In fact, I was probably about, uh, about what would I have been? Uh, about 10 to 12, 15 years old when this was really coming into uh, the field of science of radio astronomy. So this is a uh, pretty new. Um, so here we go, a uh, lot, lot to this. I'll try to stay on target as fast as I can. First, I'm trying to do this even for high school groups. I've not done it yet, but I've had several interested in it. So I want to just do this like you don't know anything at all. Although some of you are, probably ought to be here pushing the buttons and doing the call. Uh, how do you define radio astronomy? That would be a fun thing to do, particularly uh, astronomy. But uh, if you've had any Greek in your uh, life at all, you would know that uh, astro is a Greek word, an old Greek word for stars. And uh, anomy is the word, I think the basic root word of it is uh, of the law, study the law, and all the regulations, how things work, and so forth. So we apply it to astronomy, the study of the stars. Um, so that line of presentation is this. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, visual astronomy, just what you can see with your eyes. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is optical telescope astronomy. And uh, you think, may think you know all about that, but how this all fits in with radio astronomy is quite astonishing. Then I'm going to talk about radio telescope astronomy. And then uh, the last thing to do is take you to the Green Bank, West Virginia Observatory. And some of you here, I know have been there. How many of you have actually been there before and 
made the trip and seen that. There are quite a few of them. Um, so you could, uh, you'll recognize a lot of this. I want to start off with the, the oldest astronomer that I know wrote something about the stars. And uh, this is about a thousand years before Christ. An ancient astronomer said, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies uh, proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they, the stars, pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the very end of the world. The stars are amazing. And regardless what background you are and how far back in history you may go, people have always been fascinated by the stars. Uh, more, uh, more recent than that, I guess, is historically, uh, Aristotle might be one that was really into the science of things, not the first scientist, but uh, certainly one of the ones we would go back to. He thought the earth was composed of water, fire, air, and earth, those four elements or essences. But he said uh, the stars were different. They were they were high. They were not somehow confined to the earth. And the stars formed what he called a, a quintessence, a fifth essence. And uh, he called it also the ether. So we, we always wonder where these words come from. That's part of it. Uh, the substance ascends uh, ether, or the quintessence ascends all above the earth. It is very light, obviously. It's strong, it's round, it's unchanging, and always in continuous circular motion. So he had a foundation for something about astronomy. Uh, Euclid, uh, around uh, what, 300 years before Christ, uh, became known as the father of geometry. And using just a straight edge and a compass, and maybe nothing else but those two things, he was able to develop all sorts of geometry that was very soon used to try to measure the stars and distance between them and so forth. Uh, Aristarchus, about 250 years before, before Christ, uh, determined that the sun is the very center of the universe and the earth actually rotated. Now, just how he did all that, I'm not sure. Aristosthenes, about uh, 200, a little bit more than that before years before Christ, actually came up with a simple method that worked and he measured the diameter of the earth. In addition to that, he measured the distance to the sun. The uh, diameter of the earth that he measured, he calculated uh, from his scientific instruments, uh, I understand was in, within 5% of what we believe it to be today. He was uh, much further off on the distance to the sun. I think he was 95% wrong on it. But as far as the uh, diameter of the earth, he was very good. Ptolemy was somewhere around um, oh, uh, 150 years after Christ. And he's the one that stated that the earth had to be the center of the universe. And uh, that was the science of the day in his day. And it became the science of the day for 1300 years that the earth is the very center of the universe. Uh, Copernicus came along around, uh, uh, what would that be, 1525 or so. And he, uh, he didn't have a telescope. He's still using his bare eyes and uh, measuring with rods and sticks and things like that. Uh, he determined that the sun was actually the center of the universe, not what Ptolemy thought it was. And he referred to them as the heavenly spheres above us. Uh, Tycho Bray, around uh, uh, close to 1600 uh, AD, uh, cataloged the observations and measurements. It was Galileo that came along around uh, 1600 and actually built a telescope and for the first time looked at something in the heavens uh, with, a, with, a, with an instrument that could magnify the light. But Newton, Isaac Newton came along around 1700, playing with mathematics and gravity and light uh, studies, and uh, he actually uh, came up with some theories about light that might work. Uh, just so to show you how remarkable some of, the, of this was before the telescope was made, here's a diagram drawn by Tycho Brahe around, around 1600. He put uh, the Earth at the very center, that little tiny dot in the center of the screen is the Earth. Around that, he had the lunar, the moon. Around that, he had the sun rotating around the Earth. 
And then he thought there were five planets, the wandering stars, Mercury and Venus, never seemed to go beyond the Earth. They always seemed to be closer to the sun. So he drew them circling the sun and the sun circling the Earth. You can see that. And then beyond going outside this, the uh, distance uh, of the Earth, uh, were the other three planets. So there's Mercury, Venus, Earth, and then Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. So he had five planets that he identified, gave the positions relative to the Earth, and outside of that, he had the celestial sphere. Hope I'm not going too far for you or going too deep. This is all, for most of you be uh, very elementary, but for some people, they may not have thought of these things. The optical telescope. There was a man by the name of uh, Hans Luper, Lupache, I believe his name was, up in the Dutch Republic at the time. And uh, around, I can't remember the exact date, I think it was 1607, I believe it was, that uh, Lupache uh, was a lens maker. And uh, they were learning how to grind uh, the glass and make lenses like spectacles or a magnifying glass. The story goes that two little kids were playing with the glasses he was baking and put them together in his shop and uh, looked at things at a distance, went outside and looked down the street, and way at the end of the street, they could see the hands on the big clock. And uh, so he made a telescope. Well, he made that and uh, played with it and uh, enjoyed uh, making telescopes. I'm not sure uh, how many he made, but he was so impressed with it, he could uh, look down the street and see the hands on the clock. He could see people walking on the street. He could uh, look further out at the sea and see ships at the sea. And then he could see the girls at the beach. I mean, all these crazy things he could do with this wonderful instrument of the telescope, the optical telescope. And uh, he patented it. At least somebody else uh, published this. Uh, the printing press was available by then. And so uh, the patent was published. And down south, way down south in Italy, Galileo got a copy of it. And he began to make his own telescopes. The first one he made was about a three power telescope. And then he uh, made, I don't know how many of them they, they believe, but he made the largest one uh, was a 30 times telescope. It was Galileo that uh, did all the things that Lippesche had done, looking at the clock down the street, the girls at the beach, everything else. But he's the first one to think to ever point the telescope up to the heavens and see what the moon looked like. At least the first one recorded to do so. Uh, when he did that, he found out the moon had craters and had mountains and valleys, and he even estimated uh, some of the distances. <clears throat> the sun had spots. All of us amateur radio operators in high frequency are always interested in sunspots. Well, he's the one credited with discovering them. He also discovered the sun rotates and tilts on its axis and so forth. He realized there were phases, like the moon has phases of the sun shining on it. Uh, Venus had phases. Uh, he looked at Jupiter and he saw four moons that he could count. And uh, we now think there's as many as 80 or 90 moons, but he could at least see four of them and uh, was impressed with that. Uh, he found out Saturn had rings. He, uh, he finally determined that science stood corrected. Ptolemy was wrong. It was not the Earth that was the center of the universe, if, uh, of, of the solar system. It was the uh, the sun that was the center of the solar system. Uh, so that it, he came to support that. Uh, the new Copernicus heliocentric solar system is what he supported and gave the evidence for it. Uh, well, it got tangled up because the church by that time, after, what, 1,200 years, 1,500 years, it adopted the science of the day, which was the Ptolemy system. And then it was confronted with, well, what we... Did science change or what? Well, science did change, and it caused all sorts of heartbreak and confusion in the history of the church. <clears throat> uh, here's a guy that uh, had a telescope custom built. You can see uh, how uh, important these were to them. This is 1644. Uh, his one, I think, was the largest one I could find. This is at the library in Harvard University, um, a, uh, a sketch. Of a massive uh, telescope is 148 feet long. Uh, you can't see it the way I've got my screen here, but on the top of that pole, there's a man that's climbed all the way up to the top, and uh, I think it's uh, it's probably 100 feet tall itself. 
but, but he's, he's laying over the top of the pole and he's reaching down trying to pull on the ropes to untangle something so they can adjust it to look at something. That's bigger than, certainly bigger than any of my antennas, and probably most of yours. The radio telescope astronomy, optical astronomy was limited to the visual light spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum. In 1704, Isaac Newton began the, the discovery of remarkable uh, discoveries of what became known as the electromagnetic field. I was in the fourth grade in Shades Cahaba High School in Homewood, Alabama, when a science teacher in the fourth grade took a stand in the basement classroom uh, on the west side of the building, turned out the lights, pulled down the shade, and punched a pinhole in the shade so the sun could come through, and she held up a prism and if you let your eyes adjust on the wall, the chalkboard across the room, you can see red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. That's what um, Isaac Newton did. And uh, he published uh, a number of papers about uh, some of his studies. Uh, 1704, he published his mm -hmm. optics uh, on a treatise for the reflections and refractions, inflections and colors of light and so forth, and a few other treatises. So uh, he, he began to realize that the, the white light is made up of all different kinds of colors. He couldn't explain that, but uh, he could make measurements about it. It led to the study of the electromagnetic spectrum that became uh, real important to us today. Michael Faraday, around uh, uh, 1850, something like that, or maybe earlier than that, actually, made experiments and uh, with with electricity, flowing electrons in a wire, and with magnets, like holding a compass near a, a wire with current flowing through it. So he, he made all sorts of experiments with electrical fields and magnetic fields as he understood them. He said, if somebody could just be smart enough as a mathematician to describe these phenomena in mathematics, that we could probably understand it better. And uh, James Clerk Maxwell up in Scotland was a physicist. He was a mathematician, and he gave us the Maxwell equations that describe the electric field and the magnetic field when they are stationary, and also <clears throat> when one moves in relationship to the other. Very complex equations. Half of you probably understand them completely. I'm still working on it after 60 years, okay? I, I wish I understood them better. I, I basically understand them, but not like some of you, I'm sure, would do it. Heinrich Hertz was a uh, German physicist. He was a young man. Uh, he was interested in these mathematical equations, and he wanted to demonstrate the phenomena of electromagnetic radiation, because it predicted that if you could make a spark of electricity, it would propagate waves through the atmosphere, or through the ether, as he thought. So uh, he was married, and uh, he took his, uh, his young wife over to the uh, room like this at the university where he was teaching, and he set up his apparatus down front, and he made some sparks down here, and her go way back up to the back of the room with a, with a loop antenna and two, uh, two gaps, and look in the dark. They turned out all the lights and looked to see if she could see a spark, and she did. And for the first time, he demonstrated this electromagnetic propagation that we call radio. I wondered where the word uh, radio comes from. I think it comes from the word radius because it's a reference to something being emitted that the, it goes out, like from a candle light, the light goes out from it. Um, there, y'all can correct me on that after the meeting if, if you got a, a better definition of it. Uh, uh, good gift. I can never say his name correctly. Uh, Googly Elmo, I think it is. Marconi, better easy to say that. Uh, it's the first one that put it to a practical use in which he was able to uh, telegraph signals without wires uh, over distances. Others demonstrated it. But what the, the point of all this is to point out that the visual light spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, has a frequency, electromagnetic frequency. It goes from 400 terahertz to about 700 terahertz as it goes up in frequency. And it's very important to realize how radio divides or expands this. Very important slide. 
you see the visual light spectrum there in the middle of the slide. But if you go below red down to infrared and keep going lower in frequencies, you finally get down to infrared, down to microwaves, and on down to radio waves. If you uh, go red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, ultraviolet, and keep going in power and frequency, you go to what we call ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. So we talk about all these different radio type signals or electromagnetic fields, but you need to stop and realize this is one of the keys that I've never really realized it like this. With, a, with an optical telescope, you can really see visually what you see optically. But with a radio telescope, <clears throat> imagine how much more you can see. <laughs> so it goes from radio all the way through gamma rays. Are you with me so far? Everybody's alert? And kind of, well, hang on, we'll go a little bit faster here. Uh, here's, uh, and, and this is where somebody may correct me later, but I think this is the way this is put together. Um, the Crab Nebula, if you look at it with your optical telescope, you'll see it one particular way. If you uh, look at it with a radio telescope or a gamma ray telescope or if you tune a radio telescope to X rays or different fields, you'll see the Crab Nebula in different forms. Uh, here's, uh, if you look on the top right of this slide, it'll show what the Crab Nebula looks like just with your eyes through a telescope, okay? Um, it breaks it up and you can see some of the patterns, the shape of the Crab Nebula. But if you looked at it with a radio telescope, then in say four or 500, uh, uh, or four or five uh, megahertz, up to a thousand megahertz, fifteen hundred megahertz. If you look at it at those frequencies, it would look entirely different. So, in the top left is a picture taken with a radio telescope and converted to light colors, so you can get a different perspective of it. It's also a uh, picture with an infrared telescope, with an ultraviolet telescope, with an X rays, and with gamma rays, and all these make it look different because of the materials that are that are you've seen. If you take these uh, six different colors, the radio telescope and convert that all to just red colors, that whole image. If you take uh, infrared and convert it to orange and uh, an image in orange, and then you have the visual light, make that all green, and the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and put those together and display them. Here's what the uh, here's what the uh, crab nebula would look like over the whole radio spectrum. So you can see right there what it looks like in the visual visible light in the top right. But if you looked at it with all these signals combined, here's what it would look like. So it'd be much more impressive in the beauty of it and so forth because you're seeing more of what's being emitted from it than just the optical. A picture of it, as you can see. This is out of a magazine. It's probably typical of a lot of astronomy magazines that show the red nebula and other nebula, but it looks different in different uh, spectrums of the uh, electromagnetic field. So, uh, how do we ever get uh, to one of these things? Here's what we've discovered with radio telescopes that we didn't have before. We now know where the radio, the center of the Milky Way is. We know about cosmic wave. Background noise that gives evidence for the supposedly the Big Bang theory. Uh, we have gamma ray bursts. Uh, we have planets around other stars that are also detected by radio telescopes, not necessarily optical telescopes. We have the universe's expansion and accelerating. We have black holes that we detect with radio telescopes, pulsars, quasars, gravitational waves, radio galaxies, fast radio bursts. Uh, Jim and I, he may have already known this, but I'd never heard of a uh, fast radio burst until I went to this conference uh, a few months ago. I think what that is, is say, with radio telescopes, they found that there's something like a flashbulb would go off just in a few nanoseconds in one spot in the sky. And then maybe the next day there'll be one in another part of the sky. And maybe over here, there's another one or another one and so forth. And I think one of the big question there is what are those and where does that energy come from to go off like a flash flow? 
that's I'm a layman at this, but some of you may be way further along in understanding that, but that's my comprehension of the fast radio burst. Uh, that all comes from radio astronomy. The 21 centimeter uh, neutral atomic hydrogen cloud is very significant. The star formations, the sun's radiation, uh, meteor uh, scatter and so forth. And uh, if any of you have been involved with SETI, S-E-T-I, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, several years ago when I was working at Comdial, that was a big thing. And people would, uh, the engineers would download the SETI program on their computers and leave it running at night to do uh, examinations looking for search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I don't think it's been found yet, but this all comes out of radio astronomy. Uh, so how do we get into radio astronomy? This is something that's brand new to me also, but I just was fascinated by it. Who invented it? Well, like um, a Galileo, a lot of people had telescopes that looking down the street at the clock and everything else they wanted to look at in the distance. But it was a uh, Galileo that pointed it up to the moon and actually looked to see what the universe looked like. Well, nobody did that with a radio telescope. Nobody pointed their gag, uh, gaggy antenna or their big loop up into the heavens to see what sort of signals are coming out of the heavens until an accident took place. In 1932, uh, Bell Laboratories and AT&T were trying to figure out how to use radio propagation to transmit wirelessly uh, telephone signals or the telephone calls across the Atlantic between New York City and London. They knew that there was some sort of a ionosphere, there was some reflective barrier up there that didn't understand it, but they were trying to bounce signals off of it. They, uh, they did it at a very low frequency they thought was best. Uh, their transmitters were at 60 kilohertz. Um, because of that, the lower side band was kind of cut off, didn't materialize, but the upper side band did. And so it might be thought of as the first single side band transmitter back in about the early 1930s. Uh, they, they tied together 20 10,000 watt transmitters to produce 200,000 watts water-cooled transmitters and transmitted, and they were able to make these telephone calls <clears throat> sometimes, but there were several things that were, that, that were against them. One of them was that the equipment was unreliable. It was too complex. Another one was the seasons of the year seemed to affect it. Even more serious was they had limited bandwidth for making telephone calls. Another limitation was it was expensive to uh, make any money off of it for a three minute telephone call would cost $75, which is equivalent to $1,300 today. But the biggest problem of all, of all was the static noise that was being picked up. So there was a young engineer that they hired. His name is Carl Jansky. Uh, he died in 1950, and uh, he earned a physics degree from Wisconsin University, and he's hired by Bell Laboratories and AT&T to uh, investigate this noise in 1928. He investigated interference, and um, for this whole uh, project of the transatlantic phones, and in 1931, he built an antenna particularly to study where the noise was coming from. Uh, here's a picture of his antenna, very famous picture. Uh, I've seen this antenna. They've actually got a replica built that uh, you can see at the Green Bank, West Virginia uh, facility. It's uh, it's 100 feet long. It's uh, it's built out of Model T uh, automobile parts, like the tires and the axle and some of the metal work on it. The rest of it's built out of lumber from the lumber yard, and uh, the uh, elements in it are built with copper pipe about about three quarter inch copper pipe. The, uh, they're built in uh, four different frames that look like cubicle quads, four different cubicle quads, all laid out on this platform, all horizontally. Uh, so you can turn this thing, this 100 foot wide, 20 by 20 antenna, wood and copper on these tires. He can rotate it in a circle and, uh, and, and create uh, the charts uh, showing what noise is detected from what different directions. Uh, it's really quite a remarkable piece of equipment. I'd like to build that in my backyard and see if I can work the code of DX with it. 
Uh, he determined three things from his studies. This took months to do. Number one, local thunderstorms were a major problem. And uh, I guess when he got the lightning hit on the antenna because there was a thunderstorm outside, he's, he marked that down as one big source of static electricity was local thunderstorms. Uh, the second source was sometimes on a clear day, uh, he, he had the same sort of noise. And we read in the newspaper that the storms were 500 miles away. So he determined the second source was distant thunderstorms. Outside of that, the third uh, source was unknown. He did not know where the other source was on a clear day with no static from uh, clouds. Uh, so he had a strip chart recorder. He uh, built this big contraption on the ground out in the uh, Taylor Field in New Jersey. And uh, we spent months working on it, studying these charts. And finally, he made two more conclusions. One was that the noise seemed to be coming from the sun when it was directed to the sun, it picked up a lot of noise. But as he studied his charts, he realized not all of it was the sun. Some of it was from some other spot near the sun. And as the uh, earth progressed around the sun, it got uh, it got more and more distance. So he'd have one spot, a lot of noise from the sun, but then there was another source. And uh, he could not determine where that was until he finally determined it was coming somehow out of the Milky Way. Well, he wanted to keep working on this, but he was uh, dependent upon an income. And Bill Laboratory said, what you're doing has nothing to do with the radio telephone service we're going to do. We're not going to be looking into deep space noise signals, things like that, because they probably don't exist. So he took his findings and he published them in the IRE, the Institute of Radio Engineers magazine. That was even still very popular when I was graduating from my college. Uh, in 1933, he published his findings, and then he went to work on other projects and did not work on it anymore. So that was the first time that uh, it, it came to be uh, realized as noise coming from outer space. Uh, to make a long story short here, he's given the credit of being the father of radio astronomy, Carl Jansen. Um, they also name a unit of measure that's very important in radio astronomy called the Jansky. One Jansky at the bottom of that picture is 10 to the minus 26 watts per square meter per hertz. I'm still working on understanding that. Some of you would be like bolts and amps to some of you, but I'm still trying to understand just what they're saying. Uh, it also pointed out that the sun, in the middle of the chart, the sun puts out a million Janskys. A cell phone a kilometer away, puts out 110 million chances. And the great big telescope that we go see in a little bit can detect a milli chance. So you can see right off, uh, the sun puts out a lot of noise that the telescope has to handle. And they certainly don't want you to cell phone uh, anywhere around the telescopes as they study. Well, nothing else was done for a few years until in 1937, an amateur radio operator this gives a lot of credit to hams. Hams have done a lot that people overlook. But a ham radio operator, W9GFZ in Wheaton, Illinois, read this article, not in an astronomy optical telescope magazine, but in the Institute of Radio Engineers. It was a radio uh, report. He read it and he was fascinated by it. Uh, this uh, young man was Grote, G-R-O-T-E, Grote, I guess, a Weaver, or Reber, R-E-P-E-R -E -E was his last name, Brooke Weber, W9GF said, Wheaton, Illinois. This is before World War II. And he decided, um, he, he was a very active ham, and he decided to build a dish antenna, a radio telescope. Here's a picture of his uh, license, amateur radio license, gave him uh, different bands he could operate on. It was good for one year, it had to be re renewed. Here's a picture of the roof of his house with a big, Looks like two by fours all nailed together, making a tower that pivots on the very peak of the roof and sticks up. It looks like maybe another 30 feet above the house uh, for his wire antennas as a ham. Here's a picture of what I think is his radio receiver in the upstairs uh, uh, the attic room. Here's a picture of his transmitter or part of his transmitter. Uh, here's his power supply. And uh, here's his QSL cards. He had QSL cards all over the wall. He had worked 60 different countries and um, 
uh, all the states. And he had a trophy on the wall for some of his accomplishments in ham radio. But he was getting had tired of working and chasing DX. And so he decided to build this radio telescope and look and see if he could reproduce and see and hear what uh, Jansky had done. So here's a picture of his telescope. He built this out of uh, the lumber from the lumber yard. He uh, used uh, sheet metal to uh, make the <laughs> dish part of it. Uh, he had, uh, I don't know if he had steel or if it was made out of wood, but he had four uh, holes going up from the sides of the dish to hold the uh, the point antenna, which is up in the tin pan, about uh, 20 feet off of the uh, above the parabolic dish. Built all of this, and uh, they argue whether it was his mother's side yard or his back her backyard, but one or the other. He must have been a single man. He was a young engineer. He was a ham radio operator at night, and worked for making a living in the daytime. But he got so interested in this, he worked on this. Took him a year to build it. And another year or two running tests and all to get the thing to really work. His uh, neighbors uh, thought he was collecting rainwater and uh, also thought that this was contraption for making the clouds produce rain. Uh, but uh, no, he had uh, greater intentions. Here's a picture of his receiver. Here's a picture of his 160 megahertz test oscillator. It looks like it's got um, some sort of a tube inside of a glass chimney of a uh, of an old oil lamp. Uh, it's got a copper rod and it looks like it's a matching network or something. Um, but anyway, you, you can uh, generate 160 megahertz. Uh, here's another picture of his receiver and the headphones. Here I'm looking in a glass case and Jim was standing by me at the museum part of Green Bank Observatory. Uh, here's his uh, strip chart recorder. What's that? Paper and reels and a pen that writes on it where he takes his data from his uh, uh, observations. His receiver is sitting up on top of it. Uh, to the right in the cabinet, not only is this this six foot rack, but there's another six foot panel that uh, looks like it's six foot tall, and it's got all these meters on it. And I'm standing there looking at that, and I said, Jim, I can't imagine what in the world that is. Can y'all guess what that is? You might guess it's a transmitter, and I would have guessed it's his amateur radio transmitter. But what band would that be for? Jim is sharp enough to count the meters on it. It's got 40 meters on the front of it, beautifully arranged. And so obviously it's a 40 meter CW transmitter. Okay. Y'all are awake, aren't you? I mean, <laughs> boy, I got a big war. The last time I told that story, 40 meter transmitter. His, uh, his receiver looks like it's an old national receiver or something because of the big dial, the round dial in front of it. Here's a picture of him in the top left. When he started his studies, he tried to duplicate Jansky's measurements of 21.4 megahertz, but he didn't find anything. <clears throat> Somehow he generated 208 megahertz and didn't find anything. I don't know that he, I believe he generated it, but it's, the, the chart said he generated 3.33 gigahertz he didn't see and hear anything from space. And then for some reason, he chose 160 megahertz. That's, uh, what would that be? That's just above the two meter handband. And he listened there and he had success. He was so successful, he determined that, uh, that this, the noise was coming not just from the Milky Way, but from the center of the Milky Way. And he was the first one to identify, I understand, where the center of the Milky Way was. It was a lot of information for how the Milky Way does. Some of you uh, back in college, uh, if you studied antennas at all, you would have had a book by John Krauss, Krauss's antennas, uh, the J.K. Pohl antenna that was that been popular, some of you have built, was designed by him. He was very famous. He was also a hand, W-H-A-K. Here's a picture of his QSL card. He uh, was a professor at uh, Ohio State University, became very famous. He also designed a uh, radio telescope. I'll show it to you in the next slide. Uh, but he also published a book about radio astronomy. And uh, it became known as the Bible of Radio Astronomy. So John Krauss got another good mark next, next to his name. His antenna, here's a picture of it. It's like a 100-foot uh, mirror, all made out of metal, of course, not glass. And uh, it's tilted at about 45 degree angle from the earth. 
So it receives signals from uh, outer space, bounces them off that, bounces them uh, horizontally across the yard for almost 500 feet to a parabolic dish that's 75, 70 feet tall. And from the parabolic dish, it bounces them back to the, uh, uh, to the receiving element, uh, which was a big horn antenna near the, uh, near the 100 foot uh, reflector. Um, anyway, he's very successful at doing it, kind of a crude contraption. I don't know that it really was very successful, but John Krauss was instrumental in some of this. In the 1960s, when I was in college, uh, they discovered the cosmic background noise. And I remember the Bell Telephone, I think, was trying to put up these big, I don't know how large they were, maybe 100 foot diameter balloons that were covered with aluminum, I think. And uh, they launched those, they went up maybe several hundred thousand feet and they tried to bounce telephone signals off of them and see if that would be a passive satellite, early satellites. And uh, one of the things they discovered with this enormous antenna called a horn antenna, a uh, parabolic reflector inside of a big horn, uh, was cosmic background noise. They discovered that there was a subtle noise coming from every direction in space. And from that, uh, they considered that was some of the evidence that this remnants of the Big Bang Theory of how the universe started. Uh, they won the Nobel Prize for that. Uh, Arno Penzis, uh, I believe it is, and Robert Wilson. And we got uh, several Wilsons involved here. Jim Wilson stood with that here. This is probably his great uncle or somebody. Uh, uh, you remember the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico? Uh, it was one of the largest uh, telescopes in the world, a thousand feet in diameter. And uh, I remember uh, just a few years ago, it was built in 1963. But on December 1st, 2020, that's three years ago almost, that one of the cables snapped going to the main uh, antenna system 500 feet above the telescope. And uh, when it snapped, the whole thing came tumbling down into the into the uh, reflective dish uh, itself. And it was so expensive to rebuild it. I think they've abandoned it. They probably will not rebuild it. So we'll get to the Green Bank Observatory. Uh, the reason I went there is because uh, Jim Wilson invited me to do this. I guess he was, he goes by himself every year, but with COVID, it was shut down. It used to be, I think, 100 people go to it, something like that, very well attended. It's mostly radio amateur operators like us that are interested in radio astronomy. So they go to Green Bank and they get the tour and they also have lectures of professional people that are probably radio amateurs also, but they're also professional astronomers. They give lectures and uh, hour long programs about their research. So I went with Jim, we had a wonderful time. Here's a picture of Jim and his wife, Becky, uh, A4BAB, long time friend. Um, we uh, can, need to know where the, the observatory is. Here's a map that pins point, points it. Uh, I drove from Chapel Hill up to Charlottesville, spent the night at Jim's home. Uh, and then we drove over the mountains through uh, Stanton and then kind of northwest from there over the windy roads in the mountains and in the middle of nowhere in the middle of West Virginia. Well, not in the middle, on the east side of West Virginia. And uh, very quiet and so on. Here's a beautiful downtown uh, uh, Green Bank. This is a, a looks like an old store, and it probably is an old store. It's the uh, police station. It's the library. It's no, no, they've got a better library now. But this police station, the post office, uh, most anything you need is in this one store in downtown, beautiful downtown Green Bank, little old country store. Uh, here's the house that Jim got us a, a not a bed and breakfast, but an what is an Airbnb where we could spend the night with, with reasonable cost. And uh, so this is a little uh, house that was built probably in 1850. And I understood that there was a newspaper article inside on the wall that said Pearl Buck, who grew up in this valley in this area, uh, had lived there. And she was famous for writing, was, was it the, uh, the green earth or the good earth? or the good earth, I think. And was the first woman to receive a Pulitzer Prize for uh, literature. But uh, she apparently lived in this little house at one time. Wasn't much to it. Here's the living room. That's where I slept on the couch. Jim was the head man in this uh, expedition. And uh, so he got the bedroom. This is looking back at the little kitchen, the little wood burning stove. 
Uh, Jim had the bedroom to the left behind that color picture. And he also had the bathroom, okay? And uh, if I wanted to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, well, that was a challenge because I couldn't seem to find it correctly, you know, in the dark. So I didn't want to turn the light on uh, for him. So uh, I used uh, the other house, the outhouse out back, okay? They actually had an outhouse. But uh, so I didn't, I didn't want to go very often in the middle of the night. If you went out the front door of the house, you had to be careful because it was right on the north-south a highway going right through Green Bank. And I had a lot of traffic in the daytime, but it picked up at night when logging trucks were going by. And uh, if you went three feet, three steps off the front porch, you were in the middle of the road and you better watch out. Here's looking across uh, the road. You see the corner of the road on the, the road on the bottom left. And, uh, but this is the farmland. This is what the country is like where the Green Bank Observatory is like. Beautiful place. Uh, the lady uh, and her husband lived in the house, uh, the, the big house, I called it. And each day she came out and greeted us and told us to have a good time at the Green Bank Observatory. Uh, I asked about uh, a picture hanging in the, in the, uh, uh, in the kitchen. It was a picture of a little country church. And I said, was that a, a country church here around you someplace? And he said, oh, yes, this is Sunday morning now. She says, I'm going to the Catholic church, but my husband's Presbyterian. He, they're without a pastor. He's an elder in the church, and he's preaching a sermon today. You can stop by it on the way to the observatory. So we got in the car and went up the street, and uh, we were number 15 and 16 in the evening that day. Uh, Dr. Glenn Langston was the uh, fellow that was the elder and preached the sermon. He is also the retired director of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory at Greenpine. So he's a professional astronomer that uh, is the high end for astronomy, and he's an elder in his church going to preach the sermon. Well, he didn't tell me he would do this, but the chairman learned out the news that I was a retired pastor also. And lo and behold, right in the middle of the service, when they had to take up the offering or didn't take it up, he called on me to lead the prayer. And uh, so uh, what a blessing to be able to be part of that. So here I've got, uh, she took my picture with a funeral home band with a, a hymn book and a little caption, Heaven on Earth. So here we're at Green Bank Observatory. And I need to take a picture of this so this can kind of sink in. If you look uh, uh, to the right in that field, to the right immediately, there's the Jansky telescope, okay? The 100 foot by 20 by 20 made out of wood and copper pipe and all that stuff. They built a replica of it there. Uh, going right down the middle of the picture is the highway, or the, not the highway, but the road going. Uh, past all the main buildings and then way back to where all the radio telescopes are in the valley. Uh, as you go down the road, immediately uh, Jansky's telescopes to the right. If you look at the uh, uh, visitor center to the left, you'll see uh, some buses pulled up in a circle. Uh, those are people that are going into the visitor center and so forth. If you look carefully in the middle of the circle, uh, there is uh, Grove Weber's uh, homemade telescope from his mother's backyard. And uh, they actually uh, had it dismantled, had him oversee restructuring it there at Green Bank, and he uh, had it restored, re put back up, it's still there, and hired him as a consultant as they started the Green Bank Observatory. As you go down the road, as you can't see very well, but there's an enormous building, L-shaped building, the Sajansky Laboratory. And that's where a lot of the research is done, that's where a lot of the equipment is uh, repaired, tested, calibrated, and so forth. And also the uh, meeting hall auditorium, similar to this that we met in. And then back on the horizon, you can see to the left is the big, big 500 foot telescope. Um, brief history: 1957, ground was broken for the uh, for the whole observatory, for the whole the place. It started in 1957. I would have been a junior in high school at the time. 1958, the next year, they had an 85-foot telescope. By 1968, they had uh, five telescopes from 40 to 300-foot diameter, and you'll see one of those in a moment. And then today, we have the Robert C. Byrd, the senator uh, from West Virginia, the Green Bank uh, Telescope. It's 500 feet in diameter. It uh, covers a range, frequency range of 200 megahertz to 116 gigahertz. Uh, 200 megahertz to 116 gigahertz, but it's an enormous uh, piece of equipment. Here's a sketch of uh, Green Bank. 
uh, along the bottom, left to right, that squiggly line, that's the highway coming through the area. From left to right, you'll see a little square. That's the uh, post office in the little downtown area. If you uh, go around the bend, you'll see the letter H. That's where our house was in the curve of the road. If you keep going a little further, there's uh, the library. A little further is the school. That's where the lady of the house uh, teaches uh, kids. If you keep going a little bit further, you uh, see the church there with this letter C. Then you come along the horizontal line and you turn into the Green Bank Observatory. So uh, Jim and I had a, a perfect place to stay, a perfect place to go to church that Sunday, and even better, easy access to the uh, whole observatory grounds. As you turn into the grounds and uh, head uh, due north in this picture, uh, you would see um, uh, Jansky's uh, telescope to the right, uh, Weber's to the left, uh, that'd be the Jansky lab. You're going back and there's all these telescopes. There's a 45 footer, there's three 85 footers across the field. There's a 20 foot uh, telescope, 140 foot telescope, and uh, of course the big 500 foot telescope back there. Here I am standing by the Jansky uh, telescope. Uh, it was called the merry-go-round antenna because you could run this thing around on the ground in a circle. Uh, and Jansky, of course, was the father of astronomy. His uh, uh, Rose Weber's uh, telescope, the 30-foot uh, diameter telescope that he had built. Here's another telescope that was there, very famous, but uh, uh, it's a horn telescope. I would say it's maybe a uh, four feet tall and maybe six or seven feet wide, uh, but it all tapers down to where the little antenna is. Uh, this was uh, used, and I don't know why it was on top of the Harvard, Harvard School of the building or not, but uh, I don't know why it was there, but it was on that uh, building that this uh, was used to prove that uh, in outer space, uh, where you have hydrogen gas, a lot of hydrogen gas, that apparently the molecules can separate and flip. And when they do that, they put out a signal at 1,420 megahertz, uh, 1.4 gigahertz or 21 centimeters. And the reason that's important is because you can make these antennas and point them yourself into the sky day or night and find these clouds of hydrogen gas. And it's thought that if those clouds is where you would most likely if you could ever find life on another planet. That's where it would be, it would be in these hydrogen clouds. Uh, there was uh, another Nobel Prize one for that discovery. There's a big sign tells you you cannot use, uh, you cannot use electronic devices uh, on the, uh, around the scopes. You cannot use cell phones, digital photography, fitness trackers, smart watches, all that stuff is a no-no. And uh, some things you could use like a hearing aid and so forth. They have a, a truck all uh, with a porcupine antennas, vertical antennas all over it, direction finding antennas. The cab, you look inside the uh, cab of the truck, is filled with electronic uh, equipment so that if you forgot to turn off your cell phone or it wasn't dead or, or something like that, that they would track you down, they would rip it out of your pocket and uh, stomp it on the ground, run over it with the truck or something. It was just a no-no to have something that would uh, do that. Here's a picture of the uh, visitor center. Uh, oh, I better move faster here. Uh, this is the Jansky Laboratory. It's an enormous building. It's at least two, maybe three stories tall. But all the laboratories and all the uh, researchers do their studies uh, from this, this uh, place. And our conference was at the end of this. The director of the Green Bank Observatory is now Dr. James Jackson. And he gave an hour talk about the big telescope that we would be uh, going to see. And uh, he told it was 23 years old. It was designed for a life of 20 years. And it's showing its age because it's beginning to rust and needs painting. And what they need is $48 million to be painted. And so if any of us wanted to contribute to the cause, he, he encouraged us to do it. But he's a wonderful person, told a lot of the research going on there. Some of our speakers were piped in by Zoom. Uh, here's Dr. Wolfgang uh, Hamann. Uh, president of Astro uh, Delia, I think it is, doctor uh, in Germany. And uh, he gave an hour long presentation on how we, as ham radio operators, could build our own radio telescopes in our own backyard if our wife would let us, you know, that sort of thing. They're really interesting presentations. Uh, here's a lady from uh, Athens State University. I, was, I didn't realize this, but Athens State, I've heard of it. It's in uh, Northeast Alabama. 
I went to Auburn and my buddies went to the University of Alabama or to Georgia Tech, something like that. But here's a lady from Athens State University finishing her PhD degree. She's now in Africa and doing research on uh, on uh, video astronomy. Uh, here's a lady that uh, uh, really interesting, very impressive. Her name is uh, Thankful. That's her first name for some reason. Thankful. So we're going to have Thanksgiving. I guess her parents are thankful for her. A thankful uh, Kamaradi, I believe is her last name, Dr. Uh, thankful Kamaradi. And she discussed a nano, nanohertz observation of gravitational waves. She's doing serious research on gravitational waves in the nanohertz field. Uh, she, you can't read that on the slide there, but she's actually uh, the NASA's uh, Einstein Research Fellow at Cornell University. So she's really high in into uh, the astronomy. I don't know if she has a ham license, but she uh, uh, she'd probably get one if she wanted, I expect. Uh, there were other talks. Here's uh, some talks that we heard, and uh, lectures, if you would, uh, on uh, low, uh, long wave uh, antenna systems that are designed for catching very low frequencies. They combine these in Australia, uh, Brazil, I believe it is, or Chile, maybe Chile, uh, South Africa, and the United States, maybe some other countries by, by computers that combine the research trying to study uh, long wave uh, radiation coming from outer space. They talk about the antennas, how they're built, and so forth. Uh, we got to meet other people that were there. There were hams that came to this conference. Here's a guy that uh, antennas all over his car. He's actually from West Virginia. And he's got a big homemade telescope in his backyard. He loves working with it. Here's a picture of me out in the field. You can see the Jansky telescope in the, across the field, way on the far side. I'm holding up what looks like an empty a rectangular turpentine can, paint can. And uh, the bottom's been cut out of it. Um, and uh, on, the, on that, it's been uh, connected some, looks like styrofoam. Uh, is a homemade uh, horn antenna. It's covered with aluminum foil. So here's a horn antenna, goes into uh, the antenna element in this tin can, and there's a little uh, wire probe from a piece of coax goes into it for the antenna. Uh, it's dangling out of it is the uh, antenna lead wire, goes to a, a bandpass filter and a uh, uh, software defined radio, then it goes to a computer sitting on the picnic table. And I'm actually waving it around, and I can actually detect uh, these hydrogen neutral gas clouds in the sky and they tell you exactly where they are. Here's some of the other fellows showing us how to operate this and how the, uh, uh, the computer works with it to display the images and so forth. So that's, uh, that's the end of our second day. Uh, here's a lady who sends us on the third day. And... Uh, Here's another fellow, uh, not related to Jim Wilson. This is another high-end guy named Jay Wilson. He was the, uh, uh, what was he, uh, Jim, the president? Oh, not the president, but the chairman of the chairman conference, of the I think. And it's a ham operator. And uh, by the way, Jim has, he's the editor of Dots and Dashes. All you guys know that. He's brought a whole pile of them to give away to you. So don't leave without getting a Dots and Dashes. You'll see the radio telescope on, on the front of it. And in a little editorial, he even put KX4P, John Green is going with him to see it. So thank you, Jim, for a little recognition. We were sitting together in the big conference room and uh, Jay was making some announcements. And I said, I said, give him a magazine, tell him to publicize this. And so Jay did take it and waved it and told everybody to pick up a copy so he could get some more subscriptions to the magazine. Jay's a wonderful person. He lives north of Boulder, Colorado, in Burthown, uh, Burthown uh, Colorado. Here he is with one of the telescopes in their collection. He does classes and research and teaches uh, radio astronomy uh, to high school kids and college students there. He did a lecture. He had a program, and he asked us and uh, uh, people there to, to think about this. Uh, he, was, he questioned the speed of life. In fact, uh, the, uh, Bob Newman is with us. Uh, I've, I've sent emails to Bob here and uh, asked him, is the speed of light always constant or can it speed up and slow down and so forth? Is uh, 
uh, how do you know that the <clears throat> universe would be as long ago as it was unless time was steady? And, you know, it's just it's something I think about. Well, this guy did a lecture on this, and he questioned how could you prove with an experiment that the length of time a minute ago was the same as it was 10 years ago, a thousand years ago, or something like that. So we're all uh, laying awake at night trying to figure out how we would do that. But I actually got to discuss it with them. It's a very personal conference. You got to personally meet these people and uh, talk with them. Uh, one of the other guys, uh, he took us on a tour and demonstrated, let us operate the 40 meter radio telescope. Uh, his name was uh, Skip uh, Krilly, uh, K7 ETI, and a very interesting guy. Uh, this is taken off of his uh, QRZ page, but he's got telescopes all over his backyard in New Hampshire and does research. Uh, is one of the most interesting people on that. I still think Jim Wilson here, K4PAB, is the single most interesting person I know. I know a lot of interesting people, but this guy's a runner up to it. This fellow was a ham operator. He, uh, I thought he worked for NASA, but no, he didn't do that. His call signs in three BEV, like billion electron volts. And uh, he was so personable, we really hit it off as a good friendship and a talk. He was a joy to know. When he got home, he sent me a, a text, uh, an email, and uh, he told me how much he enjoyed just the friendship we, we made. Um, he, he said, the Dear young sir, I really had him fooled. I'm not that young. I hope you got home okay. I got stuck in traffic. He lives in Philadelphia. He, uh, he got stuck in traffic in D.C. and did not get home until 9 p.m. I wanted to thank you for the honor of your friendship at the SARA, S-A-R-A, conference. Like you, I've been blessed through life and continue to receive blessings, but his blessings. I will send you some, uh, some more pictures, but this one is one of the orchestra rehearsals that he did for an opera I conducted last March. He's a symphony, the symphony director in, in Philadelphia. He's... He, he's got his doctorate degree in law, and he practiced law. I got tired of that, so he uh, went back and got a degree in music. He directs the symphony orchestra, and uh, particularly ones with operas. He's an expert in that. Yeah. He speaks uh, six different languages. He's just a phenomenal, friendly person. But he says, I'm sending you a picture of an opera I conducted uh, practice uh, last March. Mm -hmm. The composer was named Joseph Green. My name's John Green. My dad was Joseph Green. He said, but most people know him as Giuseppe Verde, a very famous musician indeed in the past. His name is uh, Martin uh, Novlick, and a wonderful guy. Here's a picture of him directing uh, one of the uh, rehearsals for an opera that we're going to do. Um, anyway, he was a ham operator. Here's another ham operator. Some of you that are chemists. You can recognize the uh, periodic table on the front shirt. And if you can read what the elements are on there, the first one is S for uh, sulfur, and then there's AR for arsenic, and then there's CA for calcium, and SN for sodium, I think. Yeah, yeah, so what does that yeah. spell? Sarcasm, yeah. And he had a different shirt every day. This one says, I only use sarcasm. I never heard him say a sarcastic remark. He was one of the most upbeat per per people I met. At one time, for several years, he'd been the past president of Sarah. His call signs KR5 ARA. His, uh, we got meals, we got breakfast, lunch, and supper. These are the three ladies from West Virginia that made all our delicious gourmet meals for us. Here we are eating some of the meals. There's actually 35 people packed into this room. And um, the gym uh, made me uh, do a bicycle ride. I haven't ridden a bicycle in years. You cannot drive your car down near the antennas unless it's a diesel car, uh, but they let you ride a bicycle and they had them available. Well, Jim knew which one to pick because he's been there before. So Jim got a perfect bicycle with everything working. I got one, I finally found one that had inflated tires and a bicycle chain, but it didn't have any brakes. <laughs> But anyway, I took a bicycle ride. We rode around all the telescopes, and it was just a wonderful uh, experience. Each evening uh, outside, there were demonstrations. We uh, looked for more clouds. We demonstrated other things, looked at some of the stores and so forth. And uh, they showed us how to do this on a computer. Mm -hmm. They use a program called Easy Radio Astronomy Data Collector, ECRA. 
to uh, analyze a lot of the things I see. Uh, we met in a room at night uh, called the Frank Drake Conference Room, and a very famous room now because of who Frank Drake was. Uh, you see at the end of the table there, this is uh, kind of late at night. Uh, I haven't been able to get away from uh, Skip talking about the speed of light. He's at the end of the table waving his arm, assuring me the speed of light is constant. I'm uh, to his right uh, trying to stay awake. And uh, But this is a very famous table in a very famous room because Frank Drake at this, in this room came up and, and started to publicize the idea of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, I finally asked the guy a question right across from us, and when Skip changed uh, and started answering, uh, uh, you know, talking to him, I got up and left, and we went home with <laughs> It was one of experience. Frank Drake uh, wrote an equation. He was an astronomer. I think he was working on his PhD degree. He was working in a telescope there, doing some of his work at Green Bank. And while he was doing that, he got to thinking, what is the possibility? What's the mathematical probability of finding life in deep space? And he came up with this equation, this very famous equation. Uh, N is equal to, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven factors. Uh, N is the number of distance signals possible to detect. How many could you possibly detect? Well, it depends on number one, upon the rate at which there's a star that could even support life, uh, a planet with life. Number two, what's the possibility of that star having a planet? What's the possibility of that planet having being habitable? What is what's the possibility of it having life? What's the possibility of it having intelligent life? What's the possibility of it knowing enough about electromagnetic radiation to make a transmitter and send intelligent information? And uh, number the, the last thing was what's the length of time that they might have been transmitting? If they were transmitting a million years ago and it takes a million years for it to get here. And we sent a message back, it'd be a total of two million years before we'd even start to communicate. So if you really think about the possibility, uh, it's pretty unlikely, but he came up with this equation, very famous equation. So that was the end of the, um, uh, the third day. And then we get to the last day of Wednesday morning, the big trip to the observatory. The lady comes out and tells us have a great time. Now, some of you will know this story but there was a predecessor to the 500-foot telescope. And uh, it was the 300-foot telescope that was about 28 years old, I think. And uh, I remember uh, living in Charlottesville. We lived here 30 years. I was in, in the club. And I remember uh, a few years after we moved here in 83, I think in 1988, uh, the big news came that something had happened that night. And uh, the news was this beautiful 300 foot telescope. You can see a picture of it here. Uh, down at the bottom of it, you can't see it very well, but there's a brick building. That's where a lot of the uh, equipment was for doing the research with the control and studies of the telescope. Uh, there was an operator late one night operating, uh, running their tests and so forth. And the way I understand the story is we heard an airplane crash outside that night. And, Stopped what he was doing, ran out the door to see what had happened, and what he saw was the whole telescope had collapsed that night, and uh, the frame of it somehow collapsed. Maybe uh, he pressed the wrong button or something and moved it, and it, the whole thing came down. Uh, that was November fifteenth, nineteen eighty-eight. So y'all remember hearing that story? Oh so, yeah, I know some of you would have known that. Um, Anyway, uh, the, the Robert C. Byrd uh, got the money for West Virginia to be able to build a serious telescope to be built. It, it took them 10 years to build it. Uh, if you see, I really ought to take a second here. And, and if, if, I, if you look at, at the telescope, you'll see on the left side of it, it looks like a triangle platform. Then at the bottom, there's a circular railroad track, like a railroad track. And there's four big electric locomotive engines, almost, uh, that, that this thing runs on. So the, the, the thing has a square base to it, square base of this big telescope, all mounted on these electric motors that run the telescope in its azimuth back and forth. Uh, if you look at the, uh, at the picture, you'll see uh, there's a, looks like a triangle coming up and the same thing on the opposite side. 
And then at the top of the triangle, there's a big axle that goes across and forms a pivot for the whole telescope to uh, change its elevation, declination and ele elevation. Um, if you look at the one uh, immediately visible, you'll see there's something going up the side of it. That's an elevator. And so what we're going to do is get on at the base of that, get on the elevator, and rather than walk up all the staircases going up, we're going to ride up about 150 feet to where the axle is. Then we're going to walk over to the center of the telescope and see some of the control mechanisms for it. Then we're going to walk out a platform that comes out from the telescope and to what I would call the big goose snake that goes way above the parabolic fish that holds actual horn antennas. If you look at the, uh, this is kind of a skeleton of the uh, telescope as they're uh, putting the frame all together. It's taken from the ground, but if you look up at the top, you can see very well in this particular shot. But there's 2004 aluminum panels that will make up the metal frame of the body of the par parabolic dish. Every one of these panels, all 2004 of them, have cells and motors that can drive them to adjust their position and tilt and angle and so forth in order to flatten the curvature of the parabolic dish. So there's a lot of electronics involved in at this site. Uh, some of the parameters, I don't fully understand this, but it says they can adjust this so that the noise level of the dish is 260 microns or the equivalent of five human hairs. I, I don't know exactly what that means. I can appreciate more the other thing about it, that the pointing accuracy of this telescope is two arc seconds. That's the beam width, I believe. What that means is uh, if you had a quarter and were standing in a field three miles away, this antenna could focus on that quarter. I think that's <clears throat> what's how sharp this antenna is. Uh, here's a picture of it. It was completed 10 years later in 2000. Uh, here's a picture comparing it to the um, Statue of Liberty in the Washington Monument. Uh, the Washington Monument's 555 feet tall. The uh, Green Bank Telescope is 485 feet tall. And the Statue of Liberty is uh, 305. So it's between those two distances. Uh, here's how the telescope works. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I got this picture. I understand it a little bit better. Uh, the, it's showing the dish antenna is, is flat, like it's looking straight up into space. Uh, the big gooseneck antenna contraption is uh, uh, going way up above it, several hundred feet, and has a reflector of dish on it. Well, this is, you're not going to be able to see it exactly. Anyway, the blue light is coming in. It's not light, it's radio signals come in and hit the parabolic dish at the bottom. They are reflected up, way up to the very top of the 485 foot level to a sub reflector, another reflector. And that sub reflector reflects the signals back down to maybe 50 feet below it, maybe 75 feet below it into the horn antenna. So the horn antenna is actually pointing up at the sub reflector that's getting its signal from the big dish down below. It's getting the signal from out of space. <clears throat> see, what it, see how it works? Uh, what we're going to do is uh, ride the elevator up to the axle, look around there, then we're going to walk out a plank out to the uh, other elevator that goes way up the gooseneck, and we're going to see the antennas. Uh, here's a t-shirt, a uh, picture on a t-shirt I bought for my uh, granddaughter. It just, it's a picture, uh, an artist uh, picture of drawing of the uh, telescope. It says it's the largest steerable, uh, fully steerable telescope in the world. 485 feet tall, 17 million pounds weight, 2004 panels on it that are all adjustable. It covers 2.3 acres of, uh, of uh, property, and it's all poured, uh, built on concrete base sunk in the 25 feet down in the solid Appalachian bedrock. So here we're going to go up on the scope. This will conclude the show here in a moment. Uh, these are two friends of mine uh, in Charlottesville, kind of make fun of them. Uh, they're really expert uh, guys, and uh, they, they've been to the scope before and gave me some of their pictures that I was using this. But I say uh, some of the photographs in this presentation were taken by two distinguished gentlemen, <laughs> as said with tongue in cheek, Dan Edelman, KR4UB, and Dave Felt, A4BY. He was, of course, in the, in fact, both of them believe me. 
Now here we're walking out to the diesel bus to go down to the telescope. And there's about 38 of us, I believe, in the whole group to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we're approaching the telescope. We're uh, driving into the gate at the base of the telescope. Uh, here we get off the bus and uh, we are put in three different groups and three uh, different ladies uh, uh, each take one of the groups. Uh, Jim and I were in one group and uh, they, they give tours of the uh, whole thing and they're experts at this. The lady we had, uh, I wouldn't have believed that she was 65 years old, but uh, she said she was having her 65th birthday and she'd been doing this for 30 years. And if we wanted to know anything about that telescope, she knew everything about it. Then she did. Oh, she's a wonderful guy. Here we are walking over towards the uh, base of the uh, uh, telescope. You can see how uh, large it is. Uh, we're walking over near one of the uh, electric uh, engine sets. Uh, and you can see how large the wheels are uh, for, the, uh, for the whole base. I mean, this thing weighs billions of pounds. <clears throat> and uh, the track. Um, is one of the motors uh, that's used to uh, drive the uh, platform. Uh, is looking up from the bottom, from the ground, looking up at the telescope and up the gooseneck uh, to the antennas at the top. Uh, here we walked right over underneath the uh, gooseneck and we're looking straight up to the uh, top of the uh, tower uh, to the antennas. And that's the elevator a little bit to the right there that will take us up there. Uh, here's the platform going out to the elevator to go up there. I'm kind of flipping through these real quickly. Uh, we're walking over to, um, the, to get on the, uh, the telescope itself. Um, and we're walking across uh, the, the drive, the, the roadway. There's a truck parked there. If you look behind the truck, you can see uh, a ladder that comes down from the frame of the whole telescope because it's all off the ground on these, uh, on these uh, wheels. Uh, you have to step up about a foot to get on the first step, and then you can walk, walk on up to the platform, and then you can either take the steps up to the top, or you can ride the elevators. <clears throat> uh, so that's how we get onto the telescope. Here we were taking the first ride up. We're up probably uh, 200 feet. Uh, we walked across the, uh, the platforms and so forth uh, to the uh, axle, and we looked at the axle. We're standing there smiling, and uh, uh, amazed at all the stuff we see. Jim's on the left there, and uh, I didn't, for some reason, I'm not in that particular picture. Um, here's where we're uh, looking into one of the power panel rooms underneath the main uh, uh, parabolic dish. And you can see all the heavy uh, cables and uh, breaker panels and so forth for the electrical wiring of this thing. It just wires everywhere. And uh, so Jim's on the left, I'm uh, with the red hat and the green. Uh, and over part of that uh, one panel. Here we're walking at the uh, platform, way out over the ground, 200 feet above the ground, to the next uh, elevator. And uh, my music friend from Philadelphia, the symphony director, is uh, right there in front of me. And uh, here we are, up. We've gone up all the way up to Gooseneck. We're standing where the antennas actually are. Uh, the antennas are uh, out here at the on a big platform. We're standing on bare metal that's uh, vertical, so the rain, water, snow, and everything can go through it. If you drop your car keys, you're going to have a hard time recovering them. But uh, uh, it, behind us is this big circular platform that I believe actually rotates. And on this platform, you can see the openings, the tops of uh, about six or seven horn antennas. And I'll have these guys step out of the way. You can actually see the antennas here um, right immediately in front of them. Uh, well, the biggest one there, the big one looks like a big horn, like a what the, uh, the nozzle of a, of a uh, Apollo missile. It's uh, pointing straight up as if the flame is going to come out of it. That's the uh, horn antenna. And um, in the bottom of that is a little of. Uh, 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 a wire element that's actually the, the antenna. Uh, the rest of it captures the signal that's coming into the top of it. And on top of all these, there's some of, some sort of a membrane like the top of the drum to keep bugs out and dirt out and water out and, and snow out and everything. So you can grow around body feet on these things and make sounds like drums, but that's that's what they are. They're the, the uh, element that's focusing the signals uh, down into the horn 
And underneath the horn, each one of these, is the uh, low noise amplifier immediately attached to the uh, antenna. And uh, in order to amplify the signal, convert it into something that can be used like an intermediate frequency. Um, this uh, six or seven of these, they vary in size from the real large one down to some that are very small, like right down in Konami. There's six or seven, and those are for different bands of frequencies that they want to look at. The biggest one is for the low end, the radio spectrum, maybe several hundred hertz after a gigahertz. And then the others go all the way on up to maybe even gamma ray signals. I'm not sure how this uh, uh, And they can rotate this depending on which one they want to use. Uh, there's a big room underneath this platform. We're standing on top of the, of the room. And if you look straight up, you'll see the reflector antenna above us. So this, this is a picture of a low noise amplifier. You see wave guide in it. Uh, here's another low noise amplifier they're working on. And if you look straight up from standing on the platform up to the 485 foot level, mm -hmm. there's this round circular fish <laughs> that's, uh, that's the reflector. So the signal from space has come mm -hmm. in right directly down into the parabolic dish. It's been focused uh, back up to mm -hmm. this sub reflector, and then it's focused back down into the nozzle of the horn antenna. Mm -hmm. And so far, this whole thing, and you got to imagine this. This whole thing not only just points straight up, they can be they can be tilted and pointed all the way over the horizon. Mm -hmm. And not only that, it can be rotated around 360 degrees. So it can actually point to anywhere in, in the sky above us. Um, it, it's just an enormous uh, thing. Well, that's almost the end of the show, guys. Mm -hmm. Um, y'all are pretty patient. Uh, this was finished in 2000. It's uh what, 23 years old now at its mm -hmm. painting. So if you want to take up a little collection with the radio club, I'm sure they would appreciate it. Here's my good friend uh Red. By the way, his name is Red Cap. His physical name is Red Cap. Mm -hmm. And uh his call sign is about the same. Uh this is his like every day he had a clean t-shirt on. Here's the last one. Zero days without sarcasm. Mm -hmm. Always has sarcasm. Here's a picture of our crew. Uh, from left to right, I'm the second person in the blue shirt uh, there from the left. Uh, the fourth person from the left is my music buddy with NASA on his shirt. And just to his immediate left is uh, Jim Wilson. Everybody knows Jim. He's the one that got me to go to this thing. It's been a wonderful experience, and I appreciate him so much for taking me to that. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the Green Bank Observatory. Uh, I want to close with another ancient uh, astronomer, maybe the same one, but he's about a thousand years before Christ. Uh, he says, uh, he said, the heavens, in the heavens, he has pitched the tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. So here's the sun has come up out of the chamber run its course across the sky, going back into its chamber for the night, we'll come back again the next day to run across the course at seven of the way. A wonderful experience. Thanks so much for being here and uh, watching all this. And uh, to end it, uh, happy Thanksgiving to all of you and many blessings to you. My goodness. I got, almost got everybody to stay awake and stay the whole time. Somebody had to leave probably because they had to be <laughs> I want to thank John Porter for helping me figure out how to put all this up. And I apologize that it's came unplugged or something. No, no, you're good. Uh, well, any, uh, we have time for just a, a sure. few questions. I haven't uh, heard to go anywhere, so whatever y'all want to do. I, I got I to gotta tell John, uh, yeah. you're you're not alone. A speaker, Roke Gruber, was a speaker at the Almaro Amateur Radio Club. He some, was. Some years ago. Harry, Harry Daniels told me about it. Great, great. I mean, you guys have got great love here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. With respect to the photography that you had done there, so that was all on the field. And so they, did they provide, or did you get the uh, cameras from them there, or did you just have to have some film field? Um, I use my smartphone. Oh, you did? Okay. <laughs> I use it, and I, I think you you're allowed to do that. Uh, at least at least while we were there, because it may have been maintenance time, but things were not being uh, you know set up and all. Because there were people all over that 
telescope that we're working on and just pulling wires and cables and all that. So I don't know if, if they allowed us to do it then. They did not allow us to take anything like that down to the telescope, but up at the conference center where we met, we can take pictures up there and the chance to telescope them. But no, we left our cell phones. We didn't want to get them run over and take it away from us. Well, they sold uh, one shot cameras at the store, the yeah. gift shop. Yeah. Yeah, my old time film. My buddies said I showed you a picture of two of my buddies that had taken pictures. They had gone a year or two ago and they got these uh, these uh, box cameras that uh, were not electronic. They bought them for twenty dollars and they got so many pictures and they took some of those pictures. But I, I couldn't have taken anything down the telescope. Okay. That's the only I question. I think that is well, well thank you once again. Well, thank you, Justin. Yeah. Yes. And uh, now it is time for AJ. Grab your tickets. Tickets. <laughs> All right.